those sort of dissent users and our point of view on using this very good software. I come from a university in Brussels, Vienna University of Brussels. Uh, I work in this uh, non-profit organization, an international organization, and we do development work in the tropics, in the developing world. Our group, we basically are landscape ecologists, and we do projects in Southeast Asia, we research on soil erosion, on landscape patterns, and transportation network. As we work in developing countries under international de development cooperation projects, we are always faced with the challenge of how can we share the results of our work with the local people for their own planning purposes. Specifically, we were looking for a GIS software that can read both vector and raster files and perform basic queries, basic uh, analysis, and a software where you have a very active uh, community uh, which, which can help us sustain our training activities in the local communities where we work. This is Southeast Asia, and for the past uh, 20 years, the centralization of policies has been affecting how mountain, mountainous areas, or we call uplands, are being managed. You see here the, the brown, the yellowish portions, these are upland areas. Upland areas are hilly to mountainous landscapes with steeply planned surfaces and plateaus lying at higher elevations. And in Southeast Asia, they cover roughly 50 million hectares of land with over 100 million people living there. And for the past 20 years, with decentralization, natural resource planning and management has been entrusted by the central states, by the central governments, to uh, communities in the uplands or to local communities in general. Decentralization is the distribution of administrative functions of a central authority to several local authorities. And you can see this all over Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, in Indonesia, and Thailand, and I'm talking about now in the Philippines with a local government code. Needless to say, mapping plays an important role in the communication and realization of plans. And in all Philippine policies of on planning and management of local communities, mapping is required. For the local government code, we need to do a comprehensive land use plan, and we require maps based on land use, on roads, and on services. For community-based forest management, we have we still have forests in the Philippines. Uh, communities have to uh, have to develop their own forest management plan, and they have to have their own forest land use map. We also have what we call the Indigenous Peoples Rights Act, where Indigenous peoples how to define their ancestral domains, and these domains should not be uh, deforested, but they have to do their own mapping. There are a lot of constraints to mapping in the Philippines. First and foremost, you have 1,496 municipalities uh, scattered in 7,000 islands, and they represent villages of 42,000 42, villages of 110 million people. All the planning, all the mapping, have to be submitted to provinces. And the provinces will have to submit it to the central government, and the central government will disperse the funds for the land use plans to be, uh, to be implemented. Of the uh, 1,496 municipalities that are doing uh, their plans, 50% are in the uplands. They have particular constraints that are very, uh, uh, that are mostly found in developing countries. You have lack of funds for hardware and software. You have lack of technical skills. You have, we have, we don't have a lot of uh, institutions that have uh, the capability to map. And if we do have, we have like three institutions, you have to support 1,496 municipalities. And then we don't have what you call a spatial data infrastructure to share spatial data we don't have policies to support mapping, mapping efforts. No? So all the, the mapping are done at the local level with no support at all from the government. But by law, they have to map. We have advocated uh, what we call participatory GIS. I think someone else is going to do it uh, tomorrow or the other day. Uh, participatory GIS is an approach to local mapping. It combines expert and local stakeholders' special knowledge into the mapping process. And for our own work, it is a medium of uh, instruction for us to teach uh, local government uh, planners uh, some form of GIS uh, techniques, special learning, 
and also for advocacy and decision making at the local level. What are the advantages of uh, participatory GIS? It adheres to the principles of participation, of course, where you have different local uh, people participating in the mapping process in, diff in different forms, and of course, sustainability. We want the products of GIS to remain in the local uh, authorities or to remain in the, in the municipality so that they can use it for particular work. We don't come as researchers, we go there, we map their, their data, we map their area, we study erosion and landscape, and then in the end, uh, we give it the data and they don't have anything to use. Uh, there's no matter. Yeah. Uh, Participatory GIS also promotes local stewardship and ownership of spatial data because local authorities are involved in mapping, so they have a stake in the data. And it is a way to build capacity for local towns as well to teach people, okay, how do we read maps and how can we read maps? Or how can we use maps to, to develop our municipality? There are several constraints to mapping, and these are the strategies within participatory GIS. People have lack of uh, GIS skills, we do hands on training of local planners or people who are interested in GIS. If, if you have high cost of equipment and data, we try to do cost sharing with local plant partners. We, we ourselves provide training for free and we provide the, the, the software, of course it's Mac Windows. And the equipment is shared, the cost of the equipment is shared between us and the local uh, authorities. The cost of software is of course uh, uh, dealt with with the use of open source GLS. If you check Web of, web of Knowledge for the past two for the past 10 years, the published studies on participatory GIS has been growing. You have 211 papers reported in the Web of Knowledge uh, site uh, with 1,851 citations. It has been growing from the year 2000. The first reported was in 1993, but 80% uh, of them use 80% of, of them use commercial GIS software and uh, this is not sustainable. Open source GIS is very important to participatory GIS because of its non-commercial purpose. For planners in developing countries, using open source GIS will help avoid high costs and long-term tie-ups with proprietary software. Local governments with limited budget can install and update the software anytime at no cost. And it provides a genuine platform for participation and sustainability of, of efforts to, to build. Uh, GIS uh, database. I would present, like to present to you uh, the results of our little project uh, in this upland area. It's called Claver in the Philippines, and uh, we are building a community-based land resource information system using Map Windows. I would describe to you the various uh, participatory activities that we have been uh, doing there to promote uh, spatial learning, local participation in mapping, provide examples of how. Uh, participatory GS and Map Window, they complement each other in this project and analyze some plugins in the Map Window that we have used uh, in different stages of the project and examine their capability or their usability to produce the required results for the land use plans. This is our study area. It's basically monocropping agriculture of corn, vegetables, and cassava. Um, highest elevation is 2,500 meters. For the past 20 years, uh, we have been promoting agroforestry in this area. We have been helping them plan their uh, plan the upland area to minimize the effects of soil erosion and deforestation. But we're using uh, commercial software for this. Um, my university has developed their own uh, erosion models based on uh, ILVIS, based on uh, IDRISI. Uh, but after the work that we're doing, we want to return the, the results to to the local authority. That's why we're, we're using map windows. In terms of the activity, we first start with its assessment. What do we? What does the, the local authorities or what does the local government need in terms of data? We do a resource inventory of the village, tie it up with a GPS survey. We build what we call a three-dimensional map model of the area using topographic maps that are available from the national government. We train them with the use of map window, and then we build, use uh, through hands-on training, we build a land, res uh, land resource information system. In terms of participation, village leaders and some, some students from the local, uh, local uh, 
university. They are involved up until to the, the three-dimensional model, but the, the local planners and at least some more students who are involved in the project are also being trained in map windows and uh, in the building of the land resource information system. Uh, we try to complement these two main, uh, main products, the, the three-dimensional model and the land resource information system. Uh, the three-dimensional model is a way for us to show the results of map window, and then at the same time to verify them with the community using the uh, three-dimensional map model. So if they say, okay, this is not the boundary of our village, this is not the location of the school, you have to change that. So we go back to our model, we do again our GPS survey, and then remap, uh, uh, update our JS database, and then go back to the three-dimensional model and present it back to, to the villagers or to the community. What maps did they ask from us? They needed village boundary maps, community services, local places, land cover, elevation slope, plus critical watersheds. These maps are also what we needed for our own research work on soil erosion and landscape patterns. Plus, of course, these are the maps that are needed by the leaders of the village and the local planners. And we have to look for the sources of information. Some of them are not existing, like community services maps or local places. And some of them would come from the national government. Either you buy them or they come with a quality that is so bad. So we have to return, to the, return and analyze the data ourselves. Uh, the three-dimensional map model is a scale relief model of the landscape. It is based on terrain information, based on topographic map data, and information from, from the villagers, from what we call participatory resource mapping. It's a tool for us to facilitate local participation in, in planning and the management of natural resources. Terrain information comes from topographic maps of the area, while basic map features are volunteered information from local people. This is a way for us to promote uh, spatial learning for local planners on basic geographic uh, principles or concepts such as space, distance, and location. You have to you have to think that these people we are working with are non-technical persons. They are planners. They are or they are called planners, but in fact they are part of the community. They did not study engineering. They they went to college, but they didn't do GIS or they they did not do. Uh, they don't have any scientific background, so we have to give them some, some crash course training on uh, spatial information, spatial principles. And then, of course, uh, to use the participatory uh, three-dimensional map model to teach them basic GIS, uh, better representations of local places through points, lines, and columns. This is how we did the, the map model, organizing the community in terms of who are going to work with us, where are we going to work, uh, what maps or what data do we have. Uh, we blew up the uh, topographic maps into a very good scale that can be handled by, by the community. We traced them in car carton boards. Each carton board uh, would represent an elevation layer. We pasted them, that's number four, here it goes. We pasted them, assembled the model to, to, to look like a terrain in the, in the community. We added map features, let's see number six. Adding map features was done with the community, so that, uh, and plus the GPS survey that we did, and handing over the, uh, the model to the community as a, as a way for us to sustain our efforts in, in the area. This is the scale relief model of the area. Uh, it's called Claveria. It's very hilly, it's very mountainous, about up to 2,500 meters. And the basic information that you can get here are village boundaries, land cover, community services, local places, and critical watersheds. This is uh, for us very important because you have to think that in developing countries, you don't have computers. Computers, computer use is not that much. And you don't have infrastructure where you would have constant electricity. You don't have infrastructures where you have constant internet connection. So we have to find a way to take GIS out of the box and make it more tangible to, to the community. Make it, because if we, we, we show them two-dimensional, uh, or we show them maps, planimetric maps, it's difficult for them to understand a two-dimensional paper map.
But if we do a 3D model, it will be easier for them to identify, oh, that's the mountain, and I know the name of that mountain, and oh, that's the river, and I know the name of that river. And it enriches the, uh, the database that we, we do in terms of uh, uh, updating the place names and updating even the, the representation of, of, the, the, of, the, of the outputs of map windows. We now move forward to the development of the land resource information system in map window GIS. Why did we use map window? There's so many other open source GIS up there in the cl internet cloud, but why did we use it? First and foremost, it's free. That's it, it's free. Uh, we really wanted a, uh, an open source uh, GIS that's free, lightweight, it has familiar looking GUI, Windows based, because Windows is very popular in the Philippines. Plus, you have a very active community. There's no risk that once you release, release the map window in two, three, four years' time, you don't have a community anymore, which is what the, uh, we have learned in using other open source GIS. Some of them are already gone, some of them are uh, not really uh, full freeware or not full uh, open source. We use four plugins, GIS tools, GPS tools, Shape Profile Editor, and Watershed Animation. Um, just to say that we were using 4.7 during this time. 4.8 or 4.7. This is the basic uh, framework of the land resource information system in map window. It's basically a viewer for, for the community, a viewer for the maps that we have uh, done together with them. Uh, administrative maps, biophysical maps, infrastructure, and other maps that came out from our own research work in the area. We want them to to view the maps, to at least use the use the maps for their own planning needs, without without our own because we cannot stay in the community for a long time. We have a time frame. It's, it's an international development cooperation project, so we can stay there for more than four or five years. So we leave afterwards. So what do we leave them? If we if we leave out our projects and not leave them with the data. It feels like just extracting information from, from the community and we're not sustaining our activities at all. These are some of the examples of the maps that we have developed with the community. Village boundary, with improvements with the shape of the boundaries with uh, village leaders. Uh, digital elevation map, critical watersheds using a watershed delineation tool, and schools with uh, the road network. We we, uh, we trained local planners, they underwent a series of hands-on training to build the land resource information system with specific GIS tasks using map window GIS. They collected and managed their GPS waypoints, they digitized paper maps, and they built a local GIS database, which is the prototype Elris. Our, uh, our role here now is to uh, evaluate the usability of the plugins. Usability, uh, as we define in this uh, framework, is the extent to which a product can be used such specified goals based on ISO uh, definition and that of Nielsen. We use uh, five attributes uh, identified by Nielsen in terms of like, reliability, efficiency, learnability, memorability, and satisfaction. We, uh, we evaluated one, two, three, four plugins, GIS tools for clipping, uh, working basically on vector and raster data, GPS tools, for displaying and managing GPS information, shape file editor for editing the geometry of the shape files, and watershed delineation for marking or outlining the watersheds using uh, a DEM. This we uh, we use uh, a Likert scale, seven point Likert scale, with uh, thirty two people that have been trained with uh, over the years with map windows. Well, with one, they basically are rating set. Uh, five statements related to the plugins and they would either strongly agree giving it a score of one and uh, seven and strongly disagree giving it a score of one or in between for example in terms of learnability we ask uh, we give the statement this plugin is easy to learn and then we give them the name of the plugins and they've been working on these plugins for for at least a year and these are the scores that you would have the highest scores would be for delineation, watershed delineation, and GIS tools. And GPS tools will have four. But then if we go to efficiency, GPS tools will only get a uh, strongly disagree score of one. This plugin allows me to accomplish my task in terms of efficiency. No? 
uh, high scores will be for GIS tools and for watershed delineation. The steps are easy to remember, that if I open my plugin and I know the task that I have to do, it will be easy for me to remember in terms of the arra arrangement of the, the GUI, that okay, I can remember, I will click this and this and this and this. No? So um, in terms of uh, the plugins, the high scores are with watershed delineation and GIS tools. Again, you have a very low score low score for GPS tools and Shapefile Editor. It was really bad when we were uh, uh, discussing with them with Shapefile, Shapefile Editor because uh, 4.7, I guess at that time, was, it was not really user-friendly in terms of going back or undoing what you did. So that was really difficult. And then Table Editor, if you're working with Table Editor, you're editing your points and you want to update your, your, your attributes within the Table Editor, that was uh, very slow. So it was difficult for us to explain to them, like, okay, have some more patience because this is your maps and uh, we're not just going to give you free maps. You have to work on it. Uh, in terms of reliability, the question, the statement was, I commit few errors using this plugin. Uh, higher score, again, for watershed elimination and GIS tools, and very low score for GPS tools. And the last one is in terms of satisfaction. We can really measure satisfaction. It's a very relative term. But I am satisfied using this plugin. High score again for watershed elimination. The lowest is uh, GPS tools. I want to say that uh, you have you have very high scores for watershed elimination because you only click one, two, two, two. You do one or two clicks with it, and then you you get an automated uh, um, delineation of your boundaries. And this is very important for them because they just want uh, which which watersheds are very critical in terms of uh, water use for downstream users, which watersheds are very critical in terms of protecting it against the erosion or putting more agroforestry plants. What are the lessons that we've learned while doing the, uh, the three-dimensional model? One is that it's very important for us to have a topographic map. It's the key component of, of the, the three-dimensional model. If we cannot get this from the government, it's really the, very difficult or we can uh, download it from, uh, from an external website, but then we do not get uh, very good quality uh, uh, topographic information. So this is very important to have if you're going to do the three-dimensional mapping in the future. Um, the PTGDM was a hands-on and crash course approach for us to teach spatial and GIS concepts to local planners. I think if we did not do a, a three-dimensional modeling first before moving to map windows, it would be very difficult to explain layering, it would be so difficult to explain uh, how to do, uh, why we're drawing or following a, a boundary or following a polygon. I think this was, a, this was a, a, a very good way to teach them geospatial con uh, concepts as well. And also, uh, it facilitated the initial collaboration with uh, different stakeholders and it made us jump from this technophobia that they would have uh, with GIS uh, or with any other uh, with, with any other computer tool that uh, we are showing to them. You know? It makes them uh, more tangible, so they're not very much afraid. Oh, am I going to uh, delete data? Am I going to uh, uh, color it differently? No, it's more it's more participatory. It's more informed. So uh, that, that that was. Uh, that, that made us. That made it easy for us to to get over the technophobia that the, the villagers had. Uh, in terms of map window and building the land resource information system, uh, building it within map window was was very easy. It's very straightforward. As long as you can have your base maps, your your, your base maps, uh, and then you can show it uh, within map windows. The plugins they have varying usability. We abandoned uh, GPS tools, we abandoned it completely. We use a different uh, GPS uh, management software called DNR Garmin. It's also freeware, but it's not open source. Um, we, have, we have not used the latest version of uh, Map Window, so I'm maybe talking of old uh, plugins plug here, but uh, we look forward to we look forward to use them and see if they're more usable, we'll test them again for usability. The digitized maps and the outputs of map window can enhance the content of the 3D map model and vice versa. And documentation, it's very important for what, for, for us who have been using map windows, I guess it's, it, uh, we don't read the F manual anymore, but 
but uh, it's, it's very it's very important for people who are new to, to GIS or new to this technology to have at least a uh, kind of documentation. So what we did for our own trainings was to was to develop our own documentation for these people, uh, written in their own language. And of course, lots of patience to, to work on Mac Windows version 4.6 and 7. That was uh, at that time, but now I guess it's uh, it's better for Uh Just to conclude, the local communities are very much interested to map their environment because of, of new policies or because of new laws or just because they want to map their own community for better land use planning, but they are constrained by many factors, including lack of skills and absence of supporting infrastructures in, in, in the context of developing countries. Participatory GIS projects can help communities overcome these constraint, constraints and even enhance their involvement in the planning process. Using open source GIS and specifically map windows and training local planners on, on the use of map windows ensures genuine local custodianship and ownership of GIS data and outputs. And I would like to say we have been benefiting from map windows over the years and I would like to say thank you for keeping up, keeping up the, the work that you do for updating map windows. You are helping a lot of the communities that we work with in Southeast Asia, in, uh, in the Philippines, and of course some in Africa as well. Um, and lastly, if, if you want to continue working on, uh, on local planning and mapping local, local municipalities, policies on the use of special technologies and data sets must be improved to support the decentralized planning. That's it. Thank you all. Well.